Hello, everybody. I'm Seth. Hi, everybody. I'm Seth Newberry. Uh, I am uh, a consultant to the Linux Foundation for Standards. Prior to that, I was uh, uh, the executive director of the Joint Development Foundation, which was subsequently, excuse me, joined into the Linux Foundation in about 2019. And I spent about three years with the Linux Foundation uh, developing the JDF uh, uh, within the Linux Foundation. And just recently, I've just taken a consulting role, uh, but I am also the person who manages the um, ISO pass process uh, within the Linux Foundation for JDF. So what the purpose of this is to give you an idea of what the Joint Development Foundation can do for you with, re with regard to preparing a specification for ISO using the pass process. So let me get started with the slides. Uh, uh, so first of all, there I believe this uh, link is in the chat window. Uh, but if you want to know a little more about what the uh, past process is, you can go to the JTC1 and pick up standing document number nine at this, uh, at this link here, um, which will uh, give you some idea about what JTC1 um, uh, has as, uh, as their documentation for the past process. And then also, uh, you should feel free to reach out to one of the standards team. Uh, we've got some contacts on the last slide uh, to be linked to other documents that we have, or, or call us if you just like to discuss uh, what submitting your specification to ISO would uh, 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 be like. So first of all, let's just because we're going to assume that not everybody here is a, a, a pass expert. Uh, but, you know, what is a specification? And a specification is very simply a technical description of requirements, characteristics, and features that a product or a system must possess uh, in order to function in an interoperable fashion. And a specification is typically developed by a collaboration of companies using a set of procedures that ensure that the specification reflects the technical consensus of the creators of the specifications, the companies who are making it. Um, they prevent dominance of any one company. Uh, so it, as I say, it's a, it's a broadly based consensus product. And that the specification that results is well documented and, and creates uh, a work product that's suitable for developers to implement. So that's essentially what we're trying to achieve when we have a specification. Um, the, the, the way that the Joint Development Foundation uh, helps in this area is that we are essentially a standards organization in a box, which means that we have procedures and structures that allow a specification to start quickly at a very low cost uh, with the advantages of an incorporated entity and a, and a path to standardization and ultimately to international stand, standardization. So we can scale from very small programs to very large format programs uh, uh, within the JDF uh, family. Uh, we are a nonprofit foundation. We offer pre-made agreements uh, that allow some flexibility uh, kind of through a check the box uh, um, process for things like for IP modes, for open source software, uh, and for copyright. Um, and so each project can have its own customized uh, uh, work program, but within a framework of a standardized procedure. Uh, since we are a past submitter to ISO, which I'm going to explain a lot to you in a, in a bit, uh, we do have the ability to gain international recognition of our specifications. And we've got over 30 projects and we're growing with very broad technology coverage with a really broad base of members. So the Linux Foundation uh, value proposition in all of this and the reason that we uh, brought the Joint Development Foundation and the Linux Foundation is that Linux has a very deep roots in standard setting. And we saw real advantages to merging what we were doing with the Joint Development Foundation into the Linux Foundation. So now with the Joint Development Foundation, the Linux Foundation has a continuum of programs that can accommodate the simplest um, 
uh, unfunded free uh, uh, standards bodies into very high, large customized projects. Um, and again, with a path to international recognition. The other thing that I think is underappreciated um, and that, uh, but that is one of the most powerful benefits is the Linux Foundation has one of the largest developer communities on the planet. So the developers, any specification uh, measures its success by its adoption and developers are the pathway to adoption. So with this very large developer community, the Linux Foundation really does offer one of the most comprehensive support communities from concept to implementation to adoption. So there are probably, uh, thousands is a big word, probably hundreds of different specifications setting organizations around the, around the world. Uh, most of them are focused on a particular technical market or, or a market vertical. Um, and they produce some really good specifications for their specific requirements. But it's easy to get lost in the sheer numbers. And so here's kind of an example. Everybody knows what 802.11 is because that's Wi-Fi. We all use it. It's part of our daily lives. We can't live without it. You've never heard of secure user plane simply because it's a set of technologies that allows your mobile phone to understand its position relative to a cell tower. Now, you rely on supple, but you don't know it's there because it's an ingredient. It's like the flour in a cupcake. You, you, can't, you can't tell it's there but you enjoy the cupcake. So submitting your specification to ISO through the pass process is a way to connect to one of the most premier international standards bodies, which in turn will allow you to distinguish and elevate your project uh, and oftentimes find uses that you haven't really considered. So the JTC1 stands for the Joint Technical Committee 1, very catchy name, uh, and it is a technical committee of uh, the International Organization for Standards, ISO, and the IEC, the International Electrotechnical um, uh, Committee, Commission. Um, it is responsible for developing and maintaining international standards uh, in the range of uh, information technology. And so within the Linux Foundation, it's a very good fit for us. There may be one or two things that we're doing in the Linux Foundation that may not fit in their scope, uh, but 99% of our, our, our work will. Uh, it's composed of 162 national standardization bodies from around the world. It meets regularly uh, and it votes on, a, on proposed standards. Uh, and those standards uh, that are developed by JTC1 uh, and transposed into the ISO or IEC uh, canon are used by governments, businesses, and, uh, and others to promote interoperability, compatibility, and security. So JTC1 is the organization that manages the entire pass process. And that's why it's important for me to sort of explain that. So, so the pass program is one where standards bodies apply to become authorized submitters. And the Joint Development Foundation did that back in 2019. <laughs> we were accepted. There are about 15 past submitters um, at JTC1. Um, a lot of companies you may have heard of, uh, Eclipse, Oasis, uh, Kronos Group, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a diverse body of, of um, other standard setting bodies are, are past submitters. Um, JDF absolutely treasures its submitter status. So we're pretty careful to ensure that the projects that we send to ISO are uh, of a very high quality and have strong potential for adoption. Um, we also, at JDF, we have a team of people who can provide assistance to your project uh, for past submissions. So I'm one of those people, we've got some others. Uh, Jory runs the whole show. So um, the, the standards team will know what to do if you contact them and say, gosh, you know, I think my, spe my specification is worth, is worth looking at. Uh, we also act as the interface uh, between the project and JTC1 uh, simply because I ISO is sort of a closed community. And so one of the things we, that happens is they're un, unfamiliar with lots of different people and there's sort of a standard language that we talk to them in and there's a standard process. And it really helps if we're in the middle uh, because it'll tend to go smoother. Uh, 
Um, so I'm, uh, so let, let's talk about what a pass specification is. So here's where the alphabet soup comes in. So the JTC1 IEC ISO pass process is essentially a fast track process for development, approval, and publication of international standards. Now, I'm going to show you a chart in this that's going to help you sort of put this into perspective in a couple of slides so there's no quiz on this slide. But, but PASS stands for Publicly Available Specification, um, and it's the project, it's the process of getting um, an outside specification into the ISO. And so our process tends to be quicker than if you uh, developed your specification inside ISO. A typical ISO specification will go for two to three years. Uh, and, uh, and so what happens is that we sort of jump into their process with a completed spec uh, near the end of the process. Um, but on the other hand too, it tends to be used for standards that are a little more experimental, a little more rapidly evolving. Um, but uh, again, the specification um, that JDF puts in, let me give an example here. Uh, Open Chain uh, is one of our programs that uses the, that has submitted a couple of specifications to the uh, JTC one and been accepted. And so what happens is that Open Chain, which is sort of a supply chain management specification, is now in the ISO canon and therefore allows governments and others to use it as part of a public procurement uh, uh, process because the specification has been. Um, um, adopted by ISO. OpenChain still owns the specification through J, JD, JDF, but it, uh, but it now has the authority and gravitas of an ISO specification. <coughs> so when we create an ISO specification or a, 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 a package for submission to JTC1. There are um, three documents essentially that we give them. Um, the Probably the most important document is the explanatory report. So it is a, it's a questionnaire. It's got a series of questions in it that we answer uh, uh, that helps the reviewers at ISO understand what it is they're looking at. Uh, it gives it context, it gives it, uh, and it gives it information about the specification. Some of the very important pieces in that questionnaire uh, revolve around um, adoption. Uh, nothing, nothing says quality like somebody actually using the specification. And so their goal is to see if the specification is mature enough and tried enough that it works. And um, so when you are considering whether or not to, your, your specification is ready for uh, ISO uh, uh, transposition, uh, keep that in mind. It's, it's an important question for you. Um, and also I'm gonna talk to you in a, in a couple of slides here about kind of what you need to uh, think about when you submit or when you decide to submit a, a specification, because once you submit to ISO, you actually have a responsibility. You create a lot uh, a responsibility on your organization to maintain it. Um, the other thing that's really important in the explanatory report is to be fact based, be accurate, and be circumspect about your specification. Um, these people are not going to be impressed uh, about what you think the potential of your specification is. They're going to be impressed with what it's actually done, and so. Uh, you know, this is not a place for puffing the product. It's a place for uh, really, you know, kind of giving hardcore facts and making sure that the specification is of high quality. Uh, the, the other piece uh, is the text of the specification itself. Um, ISO has very specific editorial standards that really need to be incorporated into your spec. Um, so ISO is they are not a GitHub house. They are a document oriented um, sort of word document um, uh, uh, based. Uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, that's how they distribute the specifications. And they use a lot of XML tagging and that sort of thing in order to make sure that the document is somewhat accessible. But uh, they also have very specific language in 
um, for their normative uh, reference, uh, similar to RFC 2119, uh, but they use a slightly different standard. Uh, so the, 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 the text of your document needs to conform to their, uh, their specifications. Now, and, and, and honestly, their style guide is like 200 pages long. So we do have people who can help um, uh, adapt your specification into their format. And I would highly recommend you use that simply because it is, uh, there are not that many past editors out there. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a big job and you should, you should uh, let us help you with that. And then the final piece is the file of the exhibits. And it's simply a folder that contains graphical exhibits and specification because, again, they use XML tagging, so they need to they need to have the the uh, specification itself decomposed into the component parts so that they can reassemble it in the uh, in in their document format. So the the benefits of the of of going through all of this are. Are, are, are pretty significant. Um, the first thing you get if you are a successful pass submitter is you get the gravitas of an ISO specification um, because it is recognized as an ISO specification. It gets an ISO number. Uh, it's on their website. Um, companies can buy it from ISO. Um, so they, you know, it becomes its own specification. But the great part is the submitting organization, and that in this case, this means you, uh, uh, through JDF, maintain control of the specification, and you're responsible for the updates and new revisions. So it's it's um, uh, it's 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 a it's a really um, valuable benefit to the outside world. Um, the other thing that it does is it relieves the project from the relatively ponderous process of creating a specification within ISO itself. ISO, as I said, has a very long process. It's, uh, it's a big organization with a lot of contributors. And so getting something started within ISO can be harder uh, than it is if it's within a project uh, that has a more specific focus uh, like the JDF projects do. Um, the specification must be developed under the JDF rules because the, you know they certify JDF. Um, and they certified our process uh, as being capable of uh, creating a well-formed specification. Uh, and so uh, you, you need to be one of our programs. Um, and then we have uh, several modes within the JDF. We have a, a traditional mode, which is a little more uh, formal and procedural way of putting a specification together. And we have a community specification mode, uh, which is a little less formal uh, and a little more community governed. Um, and again, you should reach out to Jory for questions about the differences between those, but, um, but either path will get you ultimately provides a route to ISO pass submission. So <clears throat> one of the other big benefits of, uh, submitting a pass uh, document to the uh, to ISO is that you're going to get a broader audience for your specification or for your technology. Um, it's a much bigger pond. Um, and so uh, Seth, I think we lost your audio. You hear me? Are you able to hear me? Dory, can you? Yeah, can we got you, you uh, signal? Yeah. Okay, hold on. I, I'm afraid my AirPods must have died on me here. All right. All right. Can you hear me all right? We got you. Good. Okay, thanks. Apologies for that. Um, uh, you also get alignment with international standards and worldwide industry trends. They, those, uh, because ISO is such a large organization, there really are uh, an awful lot of other people that you can interact with. Uh, you get the opportunity to shape cooperation between 
your your project and other international standards bodies and open source communities. Uh, that's very important. And the networking opportunities are, are also very important. So um, the, the benefits really cross over, not just technical, but into distribution. And again, as I say, the adoption of a standard is, is the thing that most determines its success. And this gives you a much larger pool of people to talk to and collaborate with in order to drive that adoption. Seth, we've got a couple of questions um, in chat that I think um, would be timely to, to um, call out from, from Leonard here. Um, Leonard was hoping we could dive in a little bit uh, into the role of the project and in, in the, the project's leadership in um, the ISO PAS process as we, for example, preparing those um, those documents that you mentioned, and then also into the updating process for for PAS. What, uh, how how are updates and revisions handled between our projects and the JTC one committee? I wonder if you could spend a minute okay. on that. Sure. So the first place is and um, hello Leonard. Uh, um, a lot of you will already have pre existing relationships with ISO committees because, um, you know, one of the things we we tend to take a perspective at JDF that a lot of the programs are not deeply involved in the standards business, um, you know, that and so every so often we get a project that is, you know, which has leadership that is very involved in the standards business and they're already, they're already well connected with the ISO uh, uh, community. And so that presents sort of actually an enhanced opportunity, I think, at one level, um, because you already have connections, you already have contacts, and presumably you've already got contacts that are within your own um, area of interest. Um, so, pardon me, um, the, uh, the, since, the J, since the past process is fairly formalized and fairly rigorous, what happens, and, and I'm going to talk about this in just a couple of seconds, there's always, whenever we send in a document for, uh, uh, as, as a package for ISO approval, there's always a socialization process that takes place because ISO is inviting us into their house. They're, they're allowing us to be part of their community. Uh, and, um, and so we need to be respectful of the fact that they may very well be working on specifications that are similar to ours. Um, and that socialization process uh, is one of those things that we try to achieve before we send our package in um, so that the uh, relevant subcommittees in ISO or, I, I, ISO or JTC1 can talk to us about what we're doing. Because if we're doing something that is just, you know, a micron off of something they're doing, that's a conflict that we don't necessarily want to create. We want to cooperate. We may not want to, we, we may not want to have our own identity. Um, now, at the, at the same time, um, it's an advisory. When we socialize, it's advisory. So we don't have to take their uh, uh, um, specific advice, but we also have to be recognizing that some of the people that are in that delegation are likely to be voting on whether or not to accept the past uh, submission that we send them. So that's one of the things to consider. Uh, so I'm not sure if I've answered Leonard's question on that piece. I'm going to move on to his other question, which is updating. <clears throat> and the answer is that um, you 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 must update your specification or at least reballot your specification every five years uh, uh, if it's a past submission. You are also able to do, you know, updates uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, so as you advance yours from a version one to a version two, and you want to take it up to pass, you can do that. Now you have to recognize that the, the pass process itself is six months long. And so you don't want to be, you don't want five revisions in the six months that you're, that you're sending something while it's being balloted. So you want to be a little thoughtful about your release schedule versus the, uh, the pass schedule. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more in, in detail in the future, uh, uh, but hopefully I've answered the question. 
All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going here because this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, kind of illustrative of what, uh, you know, what the benefits are for us. So for us, the past process is efficient. So what I'm showing you how, here on this slide is it actually came from ISO. Uh, we were in a we were in a JTC one training uh, uh, program, and I just I hijacked this slide from them, which is. This is the typical life cycle of an ISO standard. It starts with a new project that works its way into a working draft. And that working draft gets reiterated and reiterated and reiterated, you know, probably 10 plus times uh, in its life cycle. And then it moves on to what they call a committee draft, which is where the whole committee is pretty happy that the product that they've created is ready to go. And that usually takes two or three cycles uh, for the committee draft to get done. And then at that point, they move on to the draft international specification, which is the DIS box, and then on to the final draft, uh, final draft initial specification, which I think is interesting, final draft, but that's what they call it. So that is that is ISO's path forward. Um, for when we when we come in with a spec, what we will have done is sort of in the red box to the lower left, the number one, we prepare a new specification and prepare it for pass. Uh, then we format the spec and prepare the prepare the uh, uh, DIS ballot doc for packaging. And then we submit it to JTC1 under the pass transposition process. And then usually there's about an eight week period uh, where ISO uh, puts the document into their format. And then it goes into the, a DIS, a DIS ballot, um, uh, a, a draft international spec ballot. And there it goes, it sits for about three months where it's um, balloted by the um, 162 members. Now, typically about 30 members will vote on it, um, but uh, uh, that's, that's what happens after about three months. And then if it's accepted, um, it comes back to us uh, and oftentimes there are comments that are on the on the on the draft. And if there are comments on the draft, if they are what we call informative, meaning they're more they're more um, editorial comments, but they don't they're not normative, which means they don't affect the uh, uh, operation of the specification. They're not they're not technically significant. Then we'll make those informative comments edits uh if we think those are appropriate and they, they'll catch things like heading errors and spelling and and punctuation and that sort of thing and then we resubmit that final draft uh to uh to uh uh for for final transposition uh and and that takes a, a month or two where they put it into their format and then it outcomes a an iso specification now if we decide that we wanted to incorporate some of their um, uh, comments that were normative, that did affect the specification, what you would essentially do is you would restart at item number four here and you would push it back through the balloting process. So you can sort of see why you wanna manage, you wanna send something that is fairly mature in your mind because that you know you've got eight weeks plus three months plus another uh, probably two months, um, so you, you you've got a fairly long cycle and you and if if you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to keep the ISO draft up to the same level as your own draft if you have a lot of revisions going on internally. Now the fact is is that you can continue to do that because you're going to publish your draft on your website, and that is going to be the um, sort of the most current normative version of your specification, uh, but it will not have the ISO um, imprimatur on it uh, until you resubmit it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as I mentioned earlier with the past process, um, ISO IEC is inviting non-ISO participants to submit what could be potentially competing specifications into the air, their ecosystem. And we want to be respectful of that invitation. As I mentioned, there's a socialization project with the JTC1 and the ISO committees. Uh, normally, 
the JTC one provides us a, what we call a pass mentor. So in the same way that I become your interface to pass their past mentor becomes the interface to me. Uh, and so we have a, we have a past mentor assigned to us. Uh, he will help us find the right committees that might have relevant uh, uh, content that is uh, 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 relevant to us. And, and we'll set up a series of calls with that committee and just tell them what we're doing and they'll tell us what they're doing. And, and, and we, we sort of make sure that we are at least familiar with one another so that when our, when our uh, specification comes into the, uh, uh, into pass, they're, they're expecting it. They understand that they've got some context. Um, uh, and again, this avoids overlap and minor differences between similar specifications because uh, there is no benefit of having two things that are so closely aligned, but that are different, different specification numbers. Uh, we also just, we're always respectful of the guidance we get from the committees, uh, recognizing that, again, their committee members may be voting on uh, whether or not to approve our spec, uh, but we don't have to modify our spec. Uh, we've had occasions where they uh, wanted to change the approach we were using for security and open chain, and, and we just respectfully said, no, that's that would that would be too much of a difference from, from us, and we're happy with our approach. And that was and that was ultimately approved. So um, we don't have to modify the specifications based on their feedback, but you might want to consider it. Other thing I want to challenge everybody too, because sometimes people get very excited about the idea of doing this, but ask yourself why. Um, it's important that you know why you want to turn your specification into an ISO spec. Um, because you, a lot of specifications can be uh, very successful without it. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the time and effort that you spend making an ISO specification may be better suited building a community around your own. Um, know what you're going to do with that specification once it's accepted at ISO, you know, and what you're going to do with the ISO version of the specification once it's accepted. Because this does create a long-term uh, responsibility for your project. You need to curate the specification. You need to make sure it remains current within ISO, and you need to maintain it within ISO. Uh, and so it, you're, you will, if in five years you um, disband, uh, there's nobody to maintain that specification within ISO. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not quite sure what happens if we don't renew it after the five-year period. Uh, I've never asked that question. Um, um, you also want to make sure your specification is fairly stable. As I mentioned before, this is a six to nine month journey, uh, and it consumes a fair amount of JTC one and JTC and JDF resources to do it and yours. Um, uh, so, you know, you want to avoid sending revisions while version one is still being valid. Uh, so you, you, you want to make sure that your work program has enough distance between major releases, uh, that your that the that the version one is going to be useful once it's approved in ISO because if it's completely deprecated you kind of um, uh, you 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 you're not using the process to its full advantage. Um, also, you, one of the things you want to make sure you, you reballot every five years. So you want to, like I say, you want to keep your local version in step with the ISO version in the interim. Uh, and again, plan for a journey. This is a journey, not an event. Um, so you you want to make sure that you're uh, that you're committed to the journey. Um, also, being an ISO spec does not automatically bring adoption. It should. It could. I've given you all the reasons why it can. But again, that's a that also that adoption is going to come with interaction with ISO. So you also want to have some uh, resource dedicated to talking with the ISO uh, community from time to time, just to find out what's changing in their environment where where your specification is relevant, uh, and uh, continuing to use that community to help uh, bolster your your specification. And again, just ask yourself the question, would I be better off taking the same time, effort, and resource to build a user community um, to innovate and adopt rather than to go to ISO? So ask yourself hard questions before you come in.
going a little faster than I expected here, but uh, so a couple of criteria that we, we look for for success. First of all, make sure this is a meaningful specification. Um, and um, I mean, obviously, I don't think you'd be wasting your time on something that wasn't meaningful. Um, but, you know, kind of look at it from the larger international community and make sure it's meaningful to them. Um, ensure that you think that there is broad application outside of your specific community. So uh, it, it you should send in something that's got broad adoption potential. Um, you're really, you know, that's your primary goal of going to ISO is adoption. And so make sure that you're, that, you know, if you've got a very narrow community, it may not be your best move. Um, make sure it's well-written and complete. Uh, adhere to the ISO editorial standards, uh, which we can help you, we can help you do um, before you get into the process. Um, you really should, and I would almost say must have several implementations as proof of usefulness uh, and quality. Uh, there are some exceptions to this we've seen, but um, and and some specifications are uh, they're kind of recommended best practice specifications, and those work pretty well too. But make sure that you've got some some proof that this is a worthwhile specification. Uh, pay attention to the existing standards. Don't don't write something that already exists, um, and be ready to engage and work with others on similar specifications within the ISO community. As I say, this is kind of a benefit. Uh, and then take the time. Uh, I, I see, sometimes I see programs where they're really anxious to go, but they aren't quite ready. It's just isn't the, you know, it, the, the fruit is not ripe yet. Take time to do a good job, get as big a community as you can to uh, contribute to it. Uh, standards move slowly and that's a feature, that's not a bug. And so you 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 want it. You want to have consensus. You want to have a broad user community. You want to have a broad contributor community when you go in. And then listen to your JDF support team and your past mentor, because what will happen is that we will put you in direct contact with the past mentor. Uh, but we're just going to help make sure that all the all the uh, connection points are working. So let me tell you how we can help. Uh, first of all, make sure your program is working under the JDF banner. Uh, you know, the JDF is the submitter, so um, that's an important feature. Uh, let JDF look at your program and your specification to help you make sure that we think it meets the standards for pass. Uh, we can provide you some good advice here. Uh, pardon me. And, uh, you know, bring us in early. It, it, it never hurts to get a little advice and then come back six months later. Uh, work with our editors to get a suitable and compliant draft for submission. Unless you have actually written a, a standard for ISO, uh, it's a good idea to use our, our folks. Uh, the, 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 the ISO editorial standards, I think, are only written, are only taught at Hogwarts School of Magic, and there are very few of them of the editors floating around and uh, we you know we've got access to some so uh, let us help you there um we'll help you manage the process of getting the specification through their process uh we will connect with our contacts inside and let them know what's coming and 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 keep track of it uh we'll track the progress of the balloting although I'll tell you, once it goes in for balloting, it's a black box. We can't see inside that, and we don't know until the balloting ends. But we'll keep track of the dates and and, and, and so forth and help you. Um, and, uh, and we'll keep track of the dates when you need to resubmit. So what you ought to be ready for uh, as a project is the following. Put aside some time and money for the project. It's not free. Uh, uh, if you've got, so we've got some projects that go in and they're short specifications, maybe 20 pages long, and those are not too expensive for us to convert. We've also, um, uh, submitted the SPDX, uh, specification, which is about 150 pages long. And that obviously takes a lot more effort and a lot more money. Um, <clears throat> so page count and specification pro quality will drive the editorial time and expense. Um, also, you're going to have to devote some of your technical leads uh, to the project because they'll need to write the explanatory report 
they'll need to review the submission documents and they'll probably be important inside the um, uh, uh, activities we do in socialization. Uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll guide you, but, but, you know, we're not technical experts. We rely on you for that. Uh, also your technical leads will be important in the process of the, um, uh, socializing, uh, that in turn can lead to really important, uh, collaboration opportunities. And so you should look at that as an opportunity, um, not just as a sort of a requirement. Uh, and, um, again, we'll help you set up those meetings. Uh, the process is going to take six to nine months to complete, so you need some patience. Uh, but I think that if you sort of follow what we've sort of said here, at least you have an idea of what's coming. I'm going to come to my last slide. So, you know, putting your specification uh, into the uh, in, into into past can be a way to distinguish your project and make it easier for governments and others to adopt it. Uh, becoming an ISO IEC specification is a long-term responsibility, and you, you need to be ready to respect that long-term commitment. Um, you can use the opportunity to develop and network your specification in other SDOs, and that's important too. Uh, make sure it's right for your project. Not every specification needs it. And rely on your JDF team to help you succeed, and we're happy to do it. So uh, with that, I've sort of reached the end of my uh Prepared remarks. Uh, I just want to point out the context here. Jory Burson, our VP of Standards, and this is her email. And then Seth Newberry, uh, I'm at jointdevelopment.org, and I will also be happy to um, meet with you and talk to you about all this. Seth, so, we've got some great questions um, in the chat, and and I uh, want to uh, take a minute to answer those live. Um, so Leonard has a follow-up question sort of related to the project's ability to participate and lead here. Um, can the technical lead of the project be the editor for um, a JTC1 specification? Um, and what, what level of uh, leadership can the project have when the JDF is, is helping to um, process their application? Um, I, th I think you need to, split that into when you talk about leadership there's two kinds of leadership i think that that you're referring to um we're kind of the process lead we we help you get it we we help you get it through the machine um um we, we kind of we're your tax accountants here and we're going to help you get through the irs audit you're the one who's got to explain to the irs what you did though so as your your technical leadership is going to be incredibly important and again depending on what your project is like and who you are, uh, you're you're likely to already have some connections uh, inside ISO that will make uh, make you the uh, in, important lead. However, from a process point of view, we we like to maintain kind of a single point of contact for the administrative stuff. When does it go in? What are the documents that went in? We want to make sure that we have the canonical copies. Uh, because if you submit, oh yeah, we should have, we, you know, you're right, we've got a wrong number in this particular paragraph, then your version and our version will be out of sync. And so we like to maintain that integrity uh, from a process point of view. But when it comes to talking to the technical leads, when it comes to explaining what it's about, that is entirely on the uh, uh, shoulders of the technical leads in the project. Or two, when it comes to editing the document itself, I and mean, we've made references, I think, a couple of times to our um, our our spec editing team. Rex Jasky is doing a session for us on Thursday, specifically on preparing your specification uh, to meet ISO's very stringent uh, requirements for their format. And um, Rex is somebody we work with. If that does happen to be something that you already have a skill set in, which um, is a rare find, but if you have those skills, you're of course uh, welcome to prepare your own. Uh, yeah, I, I I think that is true. Uh, we've never crossed that. We, we've never seen that example. Uh, and I do think there's a certain amount of quality control we would want. So if you were if you have done it before and you know the and you know the the secret handshakes, uh, we would still probably want to do a review to make sure that we didn't see anything that was out of line. But uh, we would then, you know, but that 
that would not necessarily create an expense for you if you if you already have the editorial skills. Let me scroll back here and make sure I didn't uh, miss any. We had a couple from um, uh, Leonard and then um, also from Anna on some specifics around the editorial um, asking about templates and things like that that may be provided by the JDF, um, which of course we're very happy to provide to our projects that are um, at that point. Um, and I think more of the editorial questions um, would be answered in our Thursday webinar. Um, are there other questions from the group on the PAS submission process, however? Yeah, I think you, you mentioned something there about, you know, what do the templates look like? So one of the things that's uh, that JDF does is we give you some very rough templates, but honestly, the final template that comes out that is your specification, we tend not to be uh, highly directive there simply because depending on what your project is trying to achieve, it may have different kinds of requirements as to what they want the ultimate product to look like. Uh, but again, we can help you with what those uh, what those templates should look like. Um, but a lot of our a lot of our programs uh, sort of use their own templates from their own their own history or from their own uh, uh, particular um, needs. But ultimately, the process in pounding it into an ISO specification, it will look like an ISO specification. It'll have all the sort of right headers and and the right syntax and so forth. And that's part of what that final transposition step does for the projects, and and um, and that can take um, you know anywhere from a month, as Seth said, to you know several months, depending on how um, how backed up um, you know the team the team at ISO are on on that. Right. Um, we'd had a question about the number of um, I think that this was the question the number of projects that we've had go through. Um, this process, and at that, but I don't know, Seth, if you want to answer um, sure. that for us. We've had um, two from Open Chain, one from SPDX, and one from Green Software Foundation. And um, both one of the Open Chain specifications and one of the, and the Green Software um, specification were both validated this year and are in the transposition phase. Um, so they should be out this this fall. Um, our SPDX spec um, is up for reballoting next year, uh, I believe. I don't think we're quite that. Not quite that far along. It's five year, so I don't. I don't. I have to. I, you know, I have to go back to my my table and find out. That's yeah, I was going to say. I think I looked extensions. at the calendar and we're. we're yeah. <laughs> Another benefit of um, working through the JDF team um, as a um, kind of, as Seth kind of put it, uh, management, process management perspective, we do put these uh, dates on a calendar and can help the project maintain the deadlines and the um, process and the milestones, even as folks may dip into or out of your project because they've been moved on to other things. So we're we're here to also help make sure that if there are key deadlines like reballoting and that sort of thing uh, that your project doesn't miss it. Okay, other questions before we wrap? I think we're at the, the 50 minute mark. Have you got that both in the queue? I see like 40 in the chat. So um, if we got them all, that's great. Oh, uh, we had just one last question. It looks like from, um, from Anna, have we had any submissions rejected or have we had any problems with our submissions so far? We have not had any rejected. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, we've not had any problems so far, um, 
because a lot of our projects are sort of open source projects, it's a little bit of a culture shift for them. And so sometimes we have to explain ourselves, but so far we've not had not had issues. I think to maybe expand on that a little bit, I think perhaps because so much of the work that our projects do exists in public GitHub repositories um, and may have already a number of um, related open source implementations or plugins or things that sit around it, it bolsters the evidence that we have implementations of the specification, that we have contributors, that we have use and adoption, and that is always um, well-received uh, evidence. So um, I think there's not really been anything that we haven't been able to solve with with a, with dialogue um, and and that sort of thing. And also the past communities tends to be growing kind of in our direction. So Eclipse recently became a new past uh, submitter. Oasis, which has a lot of open source kinds of projects is a past submitter. Uh, Kronos has some uh, open source implementations that they've submitted. So there's, um, um, I think there's a trend emerging. Okay, I don't see, um, I believe all submissions have been specifications, not open source code to clarify. Yes, we submit specifications, not not open source code bases, um, yeah. but, but uh, it, again, the availability of an open source code base that is itself an implementation or an extension of a specification is, is uh, beneficial evidence. I think that's it for questions, it looks like. Um, Good. Yeah, thank you, Seth. Well, I hope this was useful. Uh, please reach out to us if you are interested in going further. Thank you so much, Seth and Jory, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.